morning to you all and welcome. I want to just begin by saying what an honor and a privilege it is to be able to spend this morning with you in celebration of Audrey's resurrection and her life as well. And thank you all for coming and thank you to granddaughter Joy and Christian for putting together that beautiful slideshow tribute. What, what a gorgeous um, a gorgeous celebration of her legacy. Thank you for that. I invite you to follow along with today's worship service in your in your bulletin today. Uh, there will be parts for us to say together in unison, and there uh, is also an insert that contains the words of the hymns that we'll be singing today. Welcome. In the name of Jesus, the Savior of the world, we are gathered to worship, to proclaim Christ crucified and risen, to remember before God, Audrey, to give thanks for her life, to commend her to our merciful Redeemer, and to comfort one another in our grief. Thank thanks be to God. God. When we were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so too we might live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Eternal God, maker of heaven and earth, who formed us from the dust of the earth, who by your breath gave us life, we glorify you. We glorify you. Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life, who suffered death for all humanity, who rose from the grave to open the way to eternal life, we praise you. We praise you. Holy Spirit, author and giver of life, the comforter of all who sorrow, our sure confidence and everlasting hope, we worship you. We worship you. To you, O blessed Trinity, be glory and honor forever and ever.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. Let us pray. God of grace and glory, we remember before you today our sister Audrey. We thank you for giving her to us to know and to love as a companion in our pilgrimage on earth. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us your aid so we may see in death the gate to eternal life, that we may continue our course on earth in confidence until by your call we are reunited with those who have gone before us. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A selection of readings from 1 John chapters 3 and 4. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Word of God, word of life. A reading from Romans, chapter 8. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord. Well, Mom was nice enough to have written down a few of her memories from her earlier life, and I thought it might be kind of fun for you to hear some of those. She said, my grandparents, parents, and our family always went to church together. I remember learning to sing the song, Into My Heart. How many of you know that one? Into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay, come in. said she learned that and Jesus loves me when she was about three or four and Jesus loves me is really kind of what summed up her life she knew Jesus loved her so she could be Jesus love to the world and she could love herself as well because if God loves you then you, certainly you should be able to love yourself and so even though it's not in the hymnal or in the bulletin I'd like to just have us all sing that together because it's kind of her theme song Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak but he is strong.
mom shared one funny memory. She said, one day when my brothers and I were little, we borrowed our neighbor's horse, horse and cart for a ride. Kurt drove, which went fine for a while. All of a sudden, the horse, tired of this, decided to run away and dumped Kurt, me, and the buggy on the road. <laughs> my brothers used to talk me into playing ball with them. We also listened to Jack Armstrong and Captain Midnight after school on the radio. Our family would play games, especially Chinese checkers. I loved to read, and I liked playing house with my paper dolls and my dolls, and I pretended that they and the barn kittens were my family. I liked to search for the baby kittens in the barn because the mama cat would move them every time I found them. My three dogs, 14 barn cats, and four work horses were entertaining, especially my dog Ginger, until he started chasing the chickens. I had a tiny piano I loved to play. In elementary school, I got to play the tonette. Remember those little plastic things? <laughs> when I was eight, I started taking piano lessons and played the big piano. When my dad went to Rushford, which was quite a ways from their farm, I could have a piano lesson and I loved it. My brothers got so tired of me playing the piano all the time. She went all the way through, I think, level eight, which was the last one in the, the piano series of the um, Sherman or Schwamm or something like that. And, uh, and then she went on to play the organ for a while too. As a child, I loved playing with all my cousins and schoolmates, especially outdoor games like tag, hide and seek, and red light, green light. I also loved to climb trees and swing in the barn. Being on the farm gave me many outdoor things to do. In the winter, I would sled down the barn bridge and ice skate on little ponds and even ski sometimes. My dear grandma Tia lived with my parents all her life. She was very much like a second mother to me. She was ever patient and good natured, a very strong person. She always had time for me and taught me to crochet. She passed on her deep faith in God to me through her love and example. Her husband, Herman, my grandpa, lived with us until I was six when he died of lung cancer. He was also a loving, kind Christian example. Mom also had an aunt and uncle who lived with her and um, another sister of her dad. And so there, it was a big family with lots of, uh, of fun memories together. And lastly, she says, life has changed a lot. I remember when a candy bar cost five cents and Franklin D. Roosevelt was president. <laughs> well, lots of people share about people at memorials, and they leave out the things that were less appealing, but there was no less appealing side to mom. She was always sweet. She was always love. She was always hospitality. The best way I can describe mom is someone who never raised her voice or said the word shut up. That was a, that was a four letter word in our house. <laughs> we, no one said that. And she never raised her hand, but she was truly a servant of Christ and Jesus' love to the world. After a long day in school, mom would be waiting to hear about how my sister Kath and my day was and would give us each her, her full attention in turn. Many times we came home to fresh baked chocolate chip cookies coming out of the oven for us. She unsuccessfully tried to make them healthier by hiding wheat germ in them when that became a craze, but there was a revolt and that did not last long. My dad being a pastor was prone to being, bringing people home who didn't have a place to stay or needed a place to sleep it off. One of the things he loved most about my mom who was 100% Norwegian was, he said, she would treat any bum I brought home off the street like he was the king of Norway. <laughs> Mom respected and dignified every person she met with her full attention, kindness, and compassion. There was always food ready to serve for anyone who showed up at our home because that was one of the main ways this quiet Norwegian showed her love and care for people. I think she passed that one on to me. Wish she wouldn't have passed on all the sweets, because I really like those. <laughs> when my little brother Paul got incurable cancer of the brain stem, her and dad brought him home from the hospital because he was afraid to stay there. And she cared for him in his own bed to the very end. 
I wanted to be able to give her that same gift in her last days, and I'm so glad she was able to stay with us in our home for the rest of her journey here. She loved it there. After my brother Paul died, Mom and Dad moved to Kalispell, Montana, where Mom became the secretary for Flathead Lutheran Bible Camp. The former director of the camp, who had just taken, uh, yeah, the, he's now a former director of the camp, but at the time he had just taken the position when she arrived. And he told me a couple of years ago, she taught me everything. I didn't know anything about business or running a camp. She helped him with everything from financials to newsletters to planning ahead to communications and how to prepare for issues that might arise. I think she learned a lot of this when she worked as the, se uh, the executive secretary for the uh, president of St. Olaf College in Minnesota for three years while my dad was in college. When our first child, Joy, was born in Minneapolis, mom and dad moved from the west side of Montana to the east side of South Dakota to Watertown, only four hours away, so they could be closer to any grandchildren they might have. In Watertown, mom helped Joanne Rohde the Lutheran Brotherhood private representative. She's in the front row. And Joanne says she never before had or after had anyone like mom work for her, that mom kept her whole business and her personal life organized for her. <laughs> when mom got to the age, or when dad got to the age where he probably shouldn't have been driving their motor home anymore because there was a good chance he'd fall asleep, mom would sit next to him in the front and talk incessantly to keep him awake, repeatedly asking him if he was getting tired. This wasn't so bad when it was Dad who was getting forgetful anyway. But the time she rode with my brother-in-law John and I, we were tempted to use duct tape. <laughs> There's only so many times you need to be asked if you're still awake. Mom has been a joy to have with us the past few years since Dad died. She was definitely getting more hard of hearing and she would always just take her best guess at what she thought someone was saying, which usually was something absolutely ridiculous that had nothing to do with anything we were talking about. And she kept us in stitches with the things she thought we were saying. And she enjoyed being a source of mirth in the home. She was such a good sport, and she even agreed to star in Ryan's short film, Blazing Cookies, just four months ago. We've been so blessed to have Ryan home uh, during this time when mom declined. She, he was just so helpful with her in ways that I couldn't help her. And, and it was just so nice to have three of us that could, you know, trade off on things. So thank you, Ryan, wherever you are now. Um, so those of you who are joining us for lunch at our home will have the opportunity to see that four-minute film, Blazing Cookies. Um, so, that would make mom very happy, I think. She always wanted to help around the house, but in the last few months, all she could really do was fold washcloths and hand towels. But she continued to ask, can I help you with anything? To which I'd reply, no, but thanks for asking. I'm thankful for my sister from Minnesota, Kath, for visiting so much, and for friends like Carol Trenheiser, Julie Curley, Ruth Anderson, and Kathy Lucia, who provided respite for us when we needed a day off or a vacation. I'm also thankful to Mary Phillips, who was Mom Stevens' minister during the time Dad was declining and died. And lastly, I'm very thankful and grateful to all of our friends at All Saints who loved my mom and became her newest church family and a great support to Jerry and me. One longtime friend of Mom said, Audrey is the closest thing to a saint on earth I've ever seen. Another said, Audrey is more like Jesus than anyone else I've ever met. I can only agree, and I strive to continue to grow to be more like her. In John's Gospel, Jesus describes the eternal future of God's children as a place of secure belonging where each beloved follower of Jesus has a place especially prepared, where they will be accompanied, welcomed, and sheltered in intimate and everlasting love. 
It's a promise that has brought comfort and hope to many and one we return to with gratitude in times of loss. We need this assurance of a place prepared for our loved ones who have gone on before us, a place ready to receive us one day too. However, the community that formed around John's presentation of the gospel cherished this theology of a dwelling place with Jesus, not only as a vision of a glorious hereafter, not just as a promise for the life to come, but as a reality that unfolds and beckons us from the moment our life begins. See what love the Father has given us, says the first letter of John that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Not only what we shall be, but that is what we are. When I was growing up, these were the words spoken by the pastor at every baptism as he held our tiny brother or sister for all to admire and welcome. These words hovered over Audrey from her earliest days. Growing up on the farm in the midst of nurturing parents, encouraging aunts and uncles, and a faith-filled grandmother. Along with the community of Arundel Lutheran Church, where she was baptized and confirmed, they created a dwelling place for Audrey, where she absorbed the truth that God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Yes, she was instructed in the faith, from the earliest sung prayers and Bible stories through her Lutheran college education and on into her continuing pursuit of biblical and theological learning throughout her adult life. But faith is as much caught as it is taught, and for Audrey, faith was passed on in the form of love. Her own mother's mother had suffered from mental illness resulting from her, with her separation from the family and her inability to care for her own daughter, Jenny. And perhaps this was part of why Jenny poured so much into her only daughter, Audrey. I will not leave you orphaned, Jesus says later in this same address to his followers. And Audrey grew up steeped in a love that said no one should be left orphaned. This love became her guiding light vocationally and relationally. No one should be forced to wonder whether and how much they are loved, whether they belong. Everyone should have a place to abide in love. Audrey made such a place for people wherever she went. Yes, she taught her children the faith with sung prayers at mealtime and prayers at bedtime, and Bible story books. But she also taught them with those warm cookies after school when they'd had a hard day. By listening to the one who was in front of her as if they were the only person in the world in that moment. By writing out the check for the tithe first when her husband Howard brought home his humble pay. She taught them in the sweet, compassionate way of guiding without raising her voice in harshness or anger. In the foster babies she brought home for the night while working for Catholic social services. In the unpretentious and egalitarian hospitality she showed toward everyone. Karin shared with me a story that in grade school a boy at the bus stop had been picking on her. And she wondered why her, her parents, though sympathetic, would not go to the boy's parents to complain about his behavior. What Audrey knew and her girls didn't was that this boy's aggression was a product of the abuse suffered at the hands of his own father, and that telling on him would only make things much worse. Instead, she explained to her daughters in word and in deed that the worse people treat you, the more they need your love. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are.
Now this radical compassion didn't mean that Audrey didn't have boundaries. Catherine remembers being shocked when Audrey politely but firmly shut the door on a pair of Jehovah's Witnesses, explaining that they already had their own religion, thank you, without even offering to feed them. <laughs> Many more, however, were those to whom she graciously opened her door, no matter what state they found themselves in. In fact, it was her faith that helped draw a young man named Howard, whom she met on a blind date, back into the church's fold, back to school and into a call in pastoral ministry. Howard had never imagined himself worthy of such a vocation, but Audrey may have been the first to nurture that spark. As Karen says, she had a keen ability to see the true self in people, not necessarily how they presented themselves to the world. And so it comes to, as no surprise to me that before arriving at a new church with her pastor husband, she would take care to obtain the church directory and work to memorize each name and face so that she already knew her church family upon arrival. This wasn't just self-serving on her part. She wanted others to feel seen and known and loved from the moment she met them. My own visits and conversations with Audrey were always something special. The small southeastern Minnesota corner of the world where she was born and raised was also the site of my first call to ministry, the place where my own babies were baptized, and I enjoyed swapping stories with her of our distinct memories in this shared special place. In addition to that, as a pastor and a pastor's wife and a mother of pastor's kids, I often felt when talking to Audrey that I was conversing with a peer rather than a parishioner, a sort of colleague in calling. And there were times when she flipped the script on me entirely. Here I'd be sitting across from her in, in her care home, concerned about how she was doing physically and emotionally, especially after Howard was gone. And she'd say something like, Oh, and it's Lent. I know you're working so hard. <laughs> and taking care of those boys as well, you've got so much responsibility. I hope you can get some rest. <laughs> I'll be praying for you. And she did. And I would walk away wrapped in love and wondering who was called to care for her. But I believe this is exactly what John and company were getting at. No one has ever seen God, the letter says, and yet, if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. In responding to God's invitation to love and be loved in the manner of Jesus, our truest selves are revealed. And we reveal to each other God's presence, God's care. When we know ourselves to be beloved by God, we reflect that love. God enables us to see and love others in that same light. And though what we will be has not yet been revealed, we nonetheless catch a glimpse of what's behind the veil when we enter into that abode of holy love. Which is why friends were able to say that Audrey was the most like Jesus of anyone they'd ever met. And the closest to a saint on earth they'd ever seen. The truth that I think Audrey would want us to understand is that we are all saints on earth. Sinners too, but saints nonetheless. Our voices are worth hearing in song, story, or lament. Our needs worth serving, our names worth remembering, our burdens worth easing, even the ones we ourselves chose, our bodies worth feeding, our souls worth tending, our hearts worth cherishing, and our lives worth celebrating. Is there anything I can do to help you? She would say to her loved ones constantly, even after her body was frail and her memory fading. 
Oh, Audrey, if only you could know how much you have helped us. You have shown us who we are, the very dwelling place of God. And so today we celebrate you, my dear. We celebrate your baptismal promise coming to full fruition, the hope of your forebears. We celebrate by allowing Jesus to take you to dinner, to seat you at a place of honor in the company of your parents and aunts and uncles, your grandmother, your beloved Howard, and all the saints. We have reason to believe that in the past few weeks you've all had one foot already there. Perhaps you've been studying the directory. We trust you fit right in. We trust because we've had a glimpse of such a place in your presence. And so, dearest Audrey, though our hearts remain troubled for a time, we will do our best to love one another the way you showed us, even when it's hard. And to let our faith show in our deeds as well as our words. We will follow what we've learned from you to grow more and more like him. Until one day, by your side, abiding in love, we will see him as he is. Thanks be to God. direction. 
Christian may die to sin and rise to share the new life in Christ. Give courage and faith to all who mourn, and a sure and certain hope in your loving care that casting all their sorrow on you, they may have strength for the days ahead. Grant to us who are still in our pilgrimage and who walk as yet by faith, that where this world groans in grief and pain, your Holy Spirit may lead us to bear witness to your light and life. Help us, in the midst of things we cannot understand, to believe and trust in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to life everlasting. God of all grace, we give you thanks that because by his death our Savior Jesus Christ destroyed the power of death, by his resurrection, he opened the kingdom of heaven. Make us certain that because he lives, we shall live also. And that neither death nor life, nor things present nor things to come, will be able to separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, and who taught us as your children to pray together this prayer. Our Father, Lord, in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Audrey Joanne. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeemed. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in life. And now, dear friends, hear this word of blessing based on Paul's letter to the Colossians. May your hearts be encouraged and united in love, so that you may have all the riches of assured understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery that is Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit. And I rejoice to see your morale 